Okay. Sev. We're here to talk yes. about accessibility today. We are. That's a big word. What um, does it mean? Yeah. So uh, on on this uh, Global Accessibility Awareness Day, and we, it just coincidentally it it falls on a Learn Swift night every year, which is kind of nice. Um, it's um, you know it's it obviously you should be thinking about it every day, but it's it's a good time to um, sort of reflect on the fact that uh, everybody's different, and um, you know if you're designing an app for yourself, that's a fairly limited view of you know for some things. You, you are a good or a reasonable approximation of the average person. But uh, in the case of uh, accessibility and usability of software, that's not necessarily the case. Um, so it can help a little bit to kind of broaden your horizons and learn about uh, other ways that people use technology and ways that you might be unintentionally making your apps harder for people to use and some things that you can do to make that easier. Uh, and I think that my favorite way to think about it is that like, it it's not like you're, it's not like you're making your app work for like this group of people over here. Um, everybody, I, I don't have the stats in front of me. I'm sure you can find stuff on the Global Accessibility Awareness Day website um, in terms of like how many people will need some accessibility device. Oh, there you go. Um, errors per homepage. Oh, that's uh, failures on homepages. That's a slightly different thing. Um, that's just like an, uh, an accessibility audit. There you go. One billion people worldwide have disabilities, and then they list out common disabilities and impairments. But the gist is that over the course of everyone's life, they'll probably need some accessibility technology or device, um, whether it's you know uh, wearing glasses as your vision gets worse, or uh, hearing um, uh, hearing augmentation, or things about uh, motor skills or cognitive impairments. Like there's so much stuff that is gonna help somebody um, that you're you're really broadening the reach of stuff you build uh, when you, you know, take a, a few minutes to figure out what are some easy things you can do to make your app a little more usable in ways you might not have thought about. Yeah, and I think, um, I think a lot of people think about disability is just someone in a wheelchair or with crutches um it, it goes beyond that and you sort of touched upon it with you know there there's um other impairments like uh, trouble with your motor skills um that can affect people that are trying to tap on things or swipe through apps um there's also visual impairment and so we want to be keeping in mind these people you know we can tap through things easily. We can read things easily. We can swipe easily. Not everyone can. And so Apple has provided us mechanisms within uh, iOS and Swift that allow us to sort of code so that people that do have those disabilities are more able to use our apps, um, which just makes everyone happier. And so today we're gonna hopefully add some accessibility features to a little Swift UI app that I've thrown together um, I'm going to start it in the simulator. Uh, no, I can start it on my phone. Um, so Real quick while we're building that, uh -huh. sorry, I'm, I'm just going to post one more link in the chat, um, which is uh, Apple posted some pretty amazing stuff yesterday, just kind of a rundown of a bunch of accessibility improvements they've made uh, just recently that they announced. Like It's the kind of thing they would have done at WWDC, but it seems like they were trying to highlight it for Accessibility Awareness Day. And there's some wildly cool stuff in here. Like They've made it possible for you to use an Apple Watch just using the hand that you're, like the arm that you're wearing it on. So like flexing your fingers or tapping one finger, like they can detect that. And um, sign language interpreters for uh, Apple Store appointments uh, and some other really cool uh, like audio and motor stuff of, especially is uh, pretty amazing. And I'm going to keep this tab and all the other tabs open so that when we put this video up on our YouTube channel. Those links are available to everyone as well. Sweet. And I will do my best to not accidentally close things today. Um, so yeah, I put together this simple little app. Um, it's an emoji picker. Uh, I'm not the best at Swift UI, and so I took Apple's uh, 
lazy H stack example and just popped it into something with a couple of labels. You can swipe right and left to go through all the different emojis and you can tap on the ones that are your favorites and they'll be highlighted blue. Uh, if you are unfamiliar with voiceover, I can turn it on. I've, I've set up my phone with uh, accessibility settings already turned on just because I wanted to make sure that I was prepared for today. But if you go into settings and look for, I, I usually search for things. It's one of the menus, accessibility. Uh, you can see uh, the features that they provide. They do voiceover, they do zoom, magnifier, so on and so forth. Um, I think today largely we're going to be focused on voiceover because that's the easiest one to do in a demo. Um, but I do encourage everyone to go through these different settings, either read up on them or actually turn them on on your phone and see how it goes. Um, I've also got it set up so that if I triple tap my home button, voiceover on, voiceover files. comes on. Double tap to open. Use 3D touch to show home screen actions. So I'm not hearing it, but I think if we can confirm in the chat, um, you should be hearing voiceover on the chat. Um, but yeah, we have this, uh, or on the stream, I mean, but yeah, we have the little bar at the bottom. So I'm going to try my best not to speak over it. Um, but since I can't hear it, we'll see what we can do. We do have confirmation in chat that we can, cool. they can hear it. Thanks. Um, so as I, available. as I swipe. Files. Find mine. Uh, I can't, I, I can, but open. you're really Use like encouraged not to when to you're testing things. I can actions. tap on things. Um, but someone that is visually impaired would not be able to tap on things. So what I'm doing to navigate is swiping from left to right. Shortcuts. Anywhere on the screen. Anywhere on the Double screen, yes. Double tap to open. Use um, 3D touch to show home screen actions. So if you can see, I'm just doing this. Files. Or, oh, yeah. Double tap. Find my. Shortcuts. Yeah, it's really. Um... iTunes store. It's confusing to start Double using because to you're open. used to your finger controlling the thing. To home um, but you have to just treat the whole phone screen as one big touch surface, and you're just concerned about uh, the direction of your swipe. So left and right moves forward and backward. Yes. So Draw I'm going to cheat and I'm going to tap on our app. Double tap to open. You can Use see. Use 3D touch to show home screen actions. You can see uh, the Siri voiceover gives us some suggestions. So she said, "Double tap to open the app." So I will. And I will swipe left to right. And nothing's quite happened. There it goes. Emoji picker heading. So that little boop noise was voiceover telling me I was doing something it didn't know how to react to. So I was swiping before I guess it loaded or something. I'm, I'm not entirely sure what the issue was there. Um, but I can continue to swipe through just like I did on my apps. Come on now. Grinning face with big eyes. Okay, we just jumped down to the bottom. <laughs> um, so it got straight down into our carousel. One F six hundred one. Face with tears of joy. One F six hundred two. Grinning face with big eyes. So you can see it's it's reading off the description of the emojis, and then below that is um, the ASCII code for it, I believe. 1F602, face with 1F600, so, beaming 1F, grinning, pick your favorite emoji. It's kind of a weird experience to, to have it describe an emoji. Um, I'm sure people have kind of gotten used to it over the years because accessibility, unfortunately, happens to be an afterthought a lot of the time. Um, but there's a lot we can do to improve how accessible this app is. Um, to review the code real quick, uh, I have a content view. And all that is is a navigation view with a title. That's how I get the big emoji picker text at the top. It has a V stack that has some text that tells you to pick your favorite emoji. And then it has an emoji picker. 
going into that. This is where that Apple uh, lazy H grid code comes in. They uh, create a grid of repeating items. They put it in a scroll view, so it scrolls left to right. And then we loop over zero to 79. I'm guessing that's how many emoji there are. Um, we get a code point, which is the index of where we're at in the loop plus this hex code. And then I pass that into my emoji cell where I turn that hex code into a string. And so that's what the 1F600 is here. And then I turn that code point again into a Unicode scalar, which is how we get the emoji. And then I pop both of those into a V stack and then add in the tap gesture, which is how. Pick your favorite emoji. Voice over off. Which is how we get the highlighting blue. Um, looking at the code, all I'm doing is toggling whether or not it's selected and then. I turn on the accent color or I make it clear, depending on whether it's selected. Pretty basic app, but it does allow us to talk through a bunch of different accessibility things to do in code. Yeah, and um, I guess the, the first thing I want to bring up, well, the zeroth thing I want to bring up is that Matt and I have both done a fair amount of accessibility stuff in UIKit, but We've done very little accessibility stuff in Swift UI. Uh, so this is definitely going to be more of a learning experience for us as we go than I think our typical sessions. Um, we're normally speaking on stuff that we're a lot more comfortable with. So uh, please bear with us. Please learn with us. Uh, hopefully we'll all uh, pick something up. Yeah, I'm actually um, I'm actually pretty excited to be learning this right now because it, it, I've been too lazy about it. And so it's, it's about time. Um, so I, I guess um, maybe we should start with um, sort of the the principles of building accessible stuff for iOS specifically, um, which is just just in terms of like the technical side. Um, generally, if you use Apple's controls the way they're intended, they have a bunch of really good accessibility behavior built in. Um, so things like buttons, um, and actually, can you throw a button on the screen uh, just like above your picker? Yeah. Just so we can see how that sort of what the interaction, maybe like a button and a toggle switch. Doesn't necessarily need to do anything. Oh, okay. Um, and then the toggle, you'll need a, um, you'll just need a binding to a um, bool. Uh, you want the one that takes a title and a binding. Uh, so the first one can be a string, and then the second one is dollar sign your binding. And the var will need to be a state var, so you can get a binding to it. If you're not familiar with that, with what that is, uh, I recommend Paul Hudson's 100 Days of SwiftUI, because we're not really talking about what SwiftUI is in this uh, session. We're just focusing on accessibility. OK, cool. Can we run this in the app and just see how the default voiceover stuff plays with this? Yeah. Voiceover on. GOV 2021, emoji picker, heading. Emoji picker, heading. Pick your favorite emoji. Hey chat, button. Switch, switch button, off. Ooh, I want to change the name of that switch. Double tap to toggle setting. Smart. Oh, sorry, I'm chewing into the mic. Find my files. Double tap to open. Use 3D touch to show home screen actions.
Emoji Picker. Heading. Pick your favorite emoji. Why is it not letting me swipe? Cat P. Cat P. Hey chat. Button. I love this app. Switch button. Off. Double tap to toggle setting. Hey you guys have said something you want to talk about with switches. Yeah, I was waiting for Siri to presumably finish talking. Um, did, try yeah. double tapping it and see. And remember, you can double tap anywhere on, on the screen. To read on. Mm -hmm. Oh, ah. and you know what? Um, let's add a slider too, because um, there's one more uh, interesting behavior that I want to show you. Just in terms of like, wh why is it important to consider the defaults and what, like what's a good approach to to adding accessibility to custom stuff? I have never made a slider in Swift UI. Cool. Uh, value in uh, do um. Value in, actually value in label is probably what we want. So you're going to need um, a binding to a, some binary floating point something, like a float or a double. Uh, that's going to be the actual value that you're setting. So like make it a, a double and then give it a default value of like zero. And then pass a dollar sign size there. And then in a range, so you can go like, let's go zero to 10. So just literally zero dot 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 10. Gotta love Swift. Three dots, three dots, three dots. I always forget. Yep. Uh, it's two dots in Git. So, you know, and then label is a closure that makes a label. So hit return and then just do like a text that is like size. Actually, try try just saying size. I think VoiceOver is going to do cool stuff with that, but this is one of those ones where I'm not exactly sure of the default behavior. Sure. All right, let's try Files. it. Double tap to open. VoiceOver does interesting stuff for adjustable values, which is why I wanted to demonstrate with a slider. Emoji picker. Heading. Pick your favorite emoji. Oh. Uh, and don't forget to bring it. Yeah, you yep. might want to resize your Xcode window because we're not using the whole thing anyway, and then you don't have to remember to bring QuickTime to the front every time. Yeah. This is also the problem of your camera placement. Ah, yes. Does that make the text too small for you? I can see it. I think it's probably okay for the uh, for the stream. Yeah. Uh, it's just barely cut off for chat. How's that for you? Good for me. Cool. Um, okay, so yeah, let's try uh, try moving the slider and see hey, chat. how button. that feels. I love this app. Switch button. Off. Double tap to toggle setting. On. 0%. Adjustable. Swipe up or down with one finger to adjust the value. Um, so yeah, try swiping up and down. I am. It's, it's booping at me. Oh, interesting. Uh, maybe. I don't know why it's booping. That's interesting. Turn off voiceover and see if you can slide it regularly. Voiceover off. Yep. And then turn it back on and see if you can adjust it now. Voiceover on. God 2021. Emoji picker. Heading. 37%. Hmm. Uh, do you have anything goofy going on with the rotor? 37. Nope. I, I reset this phone today. Hmm. Cool. Uh, if anybody in the chat knows what's going on, feel free to pipe up. Uh, I'll describe what's supposed to happen, which is as you slide up and down, it jumps by like small increments. Um, and I wanted to mention all this. You can turn voiceover off now. Um, voiceover off. Uh, just because we notice a few uh, a few things as we look at the default behavior that we get. So um, it told us what the things were. So we were on Hey Chat, and it said Hey Chat, comma button. You can see the comma because we had the little um, caption view up. 
but uh, so it describes what the thing is and that's the uh i think like the accessibility uh there's accessibility attributes um that we'll get into and again some of this is coming from ui kit but the principles are the same that there are a few different uh properties of accessibility things so there's um like the type like hey it's a button and then there's that thing that was like double tap to press this button or um you know uh oh your your bottom of your emoji things are gone why yeah. are they cut off i have no idea something about the height of your picker is weird that that could be why things are being strange um maybe um <coughs> what's defining the height of your picker your emoji picker nothing should be well how does it how does it know how tall to be uh, I don't know. Um, maybe we should just give it a fixed height for now. Uh, just because I think that might simplify things. Uh, you want to do frame and then give it a height of, I don't know, 100. And you can get rid of the other parameters. Really? Mm hmm. Huh. Autocomplete doesn't really tell you that, but that is the case. There we go. All right. Yeah, see if the slider adjusts in voiceover now. Voiceover on. God 2000. 0%. Adjustable. Pick your favorite. 0%. Nope, still getting the boobs. Super weird. Okay. Um, yeah, chat. Uh, Cat eye. Let us know if you're playing along and hey, figure chat, it out. Um, but anyway. Adjustable. Um, oh, did you post a link or is the link Swipe up to or the down repo with available? Voice over off. The link to the repo is available. It is public. I did not set it up in Moobot. But I can get it. If you have it, that'd be super duper. Otherwise, I just gotta log in real quick. Oh, I can have it. Yep. Um. Yeah. So, uh, we should. It, it's important to take note of those different behaviors. Um. Also, things like um the hint you can actually turn off in settings on the phone, like the uh, system wide, you can say, I'm, you know, I'm familiar with this stuff. I don't need the hints to know how to use a button or a slider because I'm, you know, a regular user of this. So I'm familiar with it. So you can go and turn those hints off. So it's important if you're making your own custom things, not to put any critical information in the hint because it might be turned off. Um, so I just wanted to look at that so we can start to get a sense of like, what, what kind of things, what's the cadence of a voiceover description? Like it's going to say the content of the thing, then the like type i forget as we get into it we'll figure out what that uh type thing is and then there's some other attributes like is it adjustable um what's the current value so um like for a slider what you would hear if it were working which for some reason it's not is as you swipe up and down so you, you get to the slider and it's like slider size whatever the, the title is i think uh swipe up and down to adjust and then as you adjust up and down it'll say 10%, 20%, 30%, it will it will redo the new values or or you know whatever the um whatever the units are. I forget how you customize that, but um that's a, a special value you can customize. Um and uh this stuff is all important if you're building your own custom accessibility controls, which we are. But the other point I wanted to make is that if you use Apple's default things, you get this all for free. Um, so one argument against, you know, if your designer comes to you with something wacky, some, some goofy design that requires you to build a custom UI element from scratch, either take accessibility into account and, and, you know, do the work to figure out what's, what's the closest analog in the default system to what I'm building and how do I mimic its behavior or say, Hey, if we do this, we're going to lose accessibility or have to do a bunch of custom work can we do a version of this that uses a default control and then not have to worry about that? Um, so it's definitely something to be thinking about so you can make that trade-off appropriately. Cool. 
Um, so I guess let's let's dive in and start improving some of uh, the voiceover that we have in front of us. Let's do it. Um, so the thing that stood out to me the most, and I don't know if you want to start with something simpler, is how awful the collection of emojis and codes were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so where as you're swiping through, it was doing emoji, then code, then emoji, then code, whereas we really yeah. want that to be all one little kind of grouped element. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So I think I think there's two ways we can group it, right? So we can group it and say, here is a list of all of the emojis, and then we can group each individual one. Um, and I don't even know if we need to read off the the ASCII code. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's um, you know, that would be kind of a product decision. Uh, and obviously, this is a a fake demo app. So, you know, if if that piece of um, if that piece of text there, the number, is important to the sighted user, like maybe this is a reference guide, so you need to know the codes for some software you're building, then I I would say that's critical information, and you do want to include it. Uh, if it's more just an adornment, um, then I would say leave it out. Um, so if, uh, a good example of an adornment is like if you have a, a bunch of sections in your app and each section has a custom icon, uh, you don't need to include that icon in voiceover. You would actually want to uh, make it be invisible to voiceover because it's not actually adding anything that the title of the screen already isn't adding. Um, so like one of the exercises of adding accessibility to support is finding things that just get in the way that are not relevant uh, and making sure those are uh, inaccessible so they don't cause clutter. Uh, we don't have any of those in here, but um, images, uh, I, you know, either you need to add a description for and maybe we can um, add an image later, but yeah, you need to either add descriptions to images or decide that they're not really adding anything to the accessibility experience and turn them off. Uh, but yeah, so the grouping, um, I think what we want to do, uh, I think the, the simplest version of this uh, is if we go to your emoji cell, Let me know if you were thinking of something else. But the idea is we have these two elements inside the VStack, and we want the whole VStack to read as one element. So let's say we are going to read the code, um, because that does seem sure. relevant. Yeah. Uh, so what we're going to do is after the VStack, we're going to do dot accessibility element. Uh, yeah, there's a bunch of, yeah, so the accessibility element children, and then Let's see what the options are for children. If you hit dot and then escape to get um, autocomplete, or I guess it comes up. So combine, contain, or ignore. Oh, combine is actually really interesting. Combine looks like it would actually give us what we want for free. So let's, let's try that. Um, and then there's another thing I want to try, which is customizing that uh, in case we want to do something that combine doesn't give us. Voice over on. God 2021. Pick your favorite emoji. Grinning face. New line. 1F600. Uh, for you, Zev, it didn't represent it well in the bar. It said grinning face, new line, 1F600. Gross. That new Beaming line is actually with interesting. Smiling eyes. Wait, it new said line. new line? It said 1F601. new line. <laughs> okay, cool. So that's a perfect example of where. Um, the automatic behavior is interesting, but not exactly what we want. That's kind of cool. So that means VStack is magically inserting the word new line inside its elements, which is kind of cool. Like maybe that is what you want, but in this case, it's probably not. So uh, I think we want to customize it a bit. So let's change from combine to ignore. One sec. My dog has two squeaking toys in his mouth at the same time. That's so many squeaking toys. Sorry about that. Uh, so we're changing it to ignore. My, my fidget cube is all covered in baby drool for similar reasons. <laughs> uh, yeah, so change it to ignore. Translate. And, yeah, files. let's run and see what that does. I have a suspicion seven, one. of what it does. But let's find out. Pick, pick your favorite emoji. It did not read anything. Interesting. So it's still, uh, it's still highlighting it. So that's different from ch making it not an accessibility element at all. Yeah, um, it did. It did group them, which is interesting. Mm-hmm. That's cool. 
Uh, so now what we want to do is make a custom uh, label. Um, so on a new line after that line, is it is the amount of talking over voiceover I'm doing okay? Is it coming through? I think I'm doing it more than you're doing it. Cool. Uh, so we're going to do, yeah, accessibility label. And this is going to be a text label, and we can put whatever we want in here. So what we're going to do is construct a string using the emoji and code point strings. Uh, but we can do things like, you know, visually, it's obvious that one of those things is the emoji and the other one is the code point, but maybe we want to say that explicitly in the string. Mm. Or maybe we don't, you know, it depends on what we're doing. So I would I would make a string that's like emoji and then code point colon and the code point, maybe. I don't know if that's what you're thinking, but I think that will read out the best. Code point string, yeah. And this wants this to be a text. No, it's just that it's, uh, oh yeah, sorry. It does want it to be a text, I believe, but also you need to say code point string, right? Uh, yeah. No, it's in. You it did is... in line 14. Oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It shouldn't matter, it's an int. Oh, but then, yeah, 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 you're right, 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 you are right 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 cut a point yeah so maybe put a space <laughs> um that's another thing to think about is it's going to be reading it out loud so you know it's it's going to be subject to the whims of the pronunciation of the computer voice um on ui kit there are things you can do to adjust the pronunciation uh, attributed string has some cool attributes on you, you can provide like a phonetic spelling i think some of that stuff is missing from swift ui um but also worth remembering that uh voiceover is not the only way that this stuff is going to be consumed. Um, I think this is a thing that a lot of people um, forget that uh, this same cursor setup where the cursor moves around the screen and like it reads stuff to you is also used by um, a uh, system called switch control where if you have motor disabilities and you can't use a touch screen, you might have uh, buttons or joysticks or a number of other actually in, in the new um, Apple announcements that they're, they're allowing you to basically like blow and make sounds into the microphone to move stuff around. It's very cool. Um, and that will either be showing you a little HUD on the screen, I think, or maybe it will also read things out. Uh, or uh, another really good example is a Braille display. So there are Bluetooth and USB Braille displays. So you can sort of have like one hand on the phone sliding things around and the other hand on the braille display. And as the letters are changing, you're reading stuff on screen. And in that case, you don't care about pronunciation. You want things to be spelled correctly. Uh, and those are cases where if they need to be different for voiceover versus braille versus switch control, uh, there are uh, global variables. I don't know what the Swift UI situation is, but there's like UI accessibility is voiceover enabled, something like that. And so you can query the system and say, hey, if voiceover is enabled, do this one thing. If it's Braille, do a different thing. And and you know, just something to, something to be aware of that a lot of people basically start and stop at voiceover. Um, I was thinking about what, like, why is that? Why do we focus so much on voiceover? I think it's because it's the most kind of impressive slash impactful because uh, blindness is kind of antithetical to using a smooth touchscreen with no no physical features on it. So the fact that you know they're able to to go from there to you can use this thing is like okay this is going to help the most people the most um, you know whereas like if you have a hearing impairment okay you can't you know watch a movie without subtitles or have a phone call but like you can use most things in the phone whereas if you're blind you basically are stuck without something like voiceover so I think I think that's why people tend to focus on it I think that's partly true I think also it's easy to test and once you've done it and tested it you've covered some of the other cases if not most of the other cases sure um you know if you want to go the extra mile you can do the separation of voiceover versus braille 
Um, I did want to touch upon, it is important to listen to the voiceovers because we did catch not only caught a point, but um, I can tell you from real life professional experience, there was one time that a word, um, oh, it was, it was at my current job. The voiceover label read something was invalid, but it was pronounced, sorry for the loud motorcycle. It was pronounced by voice voiceover as invalid, which was absolutely not what we wanted to be read aloud. Um, and so we do do accessibility at my work, and I'm very, very happy we caught that before we called a customer such a thing. Yeah, I had, another, I had one like that as well. I was working on a, um, a transit-related app, and we were finding bus stops. And it was reading out the name of a stop as like Milk Street opposite Kendall Street or something, I forget what it was, but uh, it, the word op in the data coming from the like transit data provider, so, so it was opposite, was abbreviated as OPP, and that sounded like at, like just when it was reading it fast in that voice, it, it was like Milk Street, op, Kendall Street, and that op sounded like at, and that's the name of the bus stop on the opposite corner. <laughs> so if you didn't hear that right, you're going to the wrong bus stop. Uh, so in that case, we wrote a giant regex that found a bunch of those common abbreviations in the transit data and substituted it and then did a custom accessibility label. Um, so yeah, you gotta, you really have to sweat those details because like you, you get to 90% and then you don't do that last thing and the accessibility support is basically useless. Um, there is a question about how we can adjust the pronunciation in chat. Um, I'm not sure in SwiftUI. In UI kit, there there is ways. Yeah, I, I think I think it might not be possible in Swift UI other than just um, you know setting you know like spelling it out in a in a way that makes sense. But again, be careful to only do that in context where it's being read aloud and not printed on screen. Like even in Voiceover, you can see you've got it on the screen there, so it's not going to be perfect. But in UI kit, um, I think on iOS 11 or something, um, they added uh, like a bunch of things had. Um, uh, accessibility label, and they added attributed accessibility label uh, to all the things, and that's an and it's attributed string, and you can set attributes uh, at ranges on the string for things like voice inflection and uh, pronunciation, uh, and even language. You can say like, hey, read this in you know if you know this is Spanish text, please read it in a Spanish voice instead of the hilariously bad you know American English voice trying to read Spanish text because it's not gonna it's not gonna sound good. Um, yeah, there you go. So you can um, do the, uh, oh yeah, read versus read. It's a really good one. I I wish that iOS had some of the support that Mac OS has. Um, there's all this really cool stuff you can do with a speech system on the Mac that's like old school, goes back a ways, where um, you can add just like brackets and parentheses and stuff to add little hint, like, like um, annotations to tweak the pronunciation. And one of the really th cool things you can do is so the, the example that uh, CP Ware brought up in the chat is read versus read, you know, R-E-A-D in both cases. Uh, what, you, uh, what you can do is you can provide a context sentence. Um, record and record is another really uh, common one, like, you know, record mm. a movie and look up a record. If it's just the, the one word by itself, it doesn't know which of those you mean. So uh, what you can do on the Mac is in brackets or something, um, you can provide a sentence and it will use probably NS linguistic tagger to um, to parse out what the part of speech is, uh, which is pretty dang cool. Looks like we have a visitor. Sam has come to say good night. Good night. Oh, good night. I love you. Good night. <laughs> I hope you sleep well. Aww. <laughs> Have a good time learning about accessibility. Sam loves accessibility. She wants <laughs> access to everything. Mwah. She does, it's true. And she needs help because she can't talk. It's true. So she needs... We, actually, now you mentioned that, we use a, an accessibility feature called switch, uh, called Guided Access. Yeah. Um, Tell them about it. Uh, which is, uh, you should look it up if you're interested, but um, you can lock, you can turn on your phone and like open an app and then use guided access to lock in into that one app or even lock the screen so that uh, touches don't do anything until you triple click the home button and type a passcode. Um, so we use it for FaceTime calls with grandparents. Uh, so you turn on guided access and then she can 
handle the phone and put it in her mouth and not accidentally hit the hang up button. <laughs> Did not know of that one. But it's also it's also good. Um, Casey List from uh, the ATP podcast um, made an app called Pika View, uh, where you uh, you open up an album of photos and then the kid can swipe through. And I forget, I think it's intended to be used with guided access. So you open up like, hey, here's your favorite photos, kid, and then peek a view, like peeking at. I, maybe he took it off the app store. I don't remember if it's still around. I think maybe it is. Um, peek a view iPhone. He's apparently not the first person to come up with that pun. So yeah, the idea is you open it up and then. Uh, I, yeah, I forget if he found a way to lock you into the app without uh, guided access, or I, I think you probably do. But anyway, it's, it lets the kid browse a safe album that you've designated. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. cool. So that, that's the other thing about these accessibility features is like they're designed for a certain thing, uh, and then you can find all sorts of other cool uses for them. Yeah, so it, it is, looked like, based on that Paul Hudson article, that we want to make it... Um, an attributed string to change the pronunciation of things. I don't know if that's yeah, necessarily that a good switch UI. I thought it was switch UI that he was doing it in. Oh, let me see. No, you're right. He was doing on label text. Yep. Yeah, I'm I've got high hopes for WWDC this year in a couple weeks. Um because like this seems like the kind of thing that you know doesn't make the cut and then they come back and and do another pass at it and with that amazing dump of accessibility stuff it looks like they're clearly firing all on all accessibility cylinders so i'm hoping that that will get some love as well this yeah. looks like a good resource on all the different attributes i also i feel like changing READ to RED isn't necessarily a scalable solution too cuz um if if that's a fixed string sure that makes perfect sense but if that's even like the least bit dynamic um you might run into trouble yep um it, yeah if you need to solve that in swift ui you might want to look at um there's a library i think it's called like introspect i might be wrong but it um it basically lets you get at the underlying UI kit views of things. And then from there, you should be able to get those APIs if you need them or just, you know, wrap your own control. There's, there's good ish, uh, ways to wrap UI kit things and expose them to Swift UI. Um, if you need to customize accessibility stuff. Yes. Um, so we have grouped our individual cells and we have adjusted the voiceover Gaming so now face with smiling eyes emoji caught a point one f 601 now we should talk about selecting uh yeah okay so if these were buttons or toggles we would get that sort of double tap to select or double tap to activate and whether it's selected we would get all that for free but uh we don't get any of that so we're gonna have to kind of recreate it uh which is great that's what this session is about um so we have two pieces of information we need to convey. We have um, a hint. So in this case, it'll be something like double tap to select, double tap to favorite. I don't know what selection signifies in this fake app, but um, yeah, accessibility hint, probably, yeah, a text. I don't know why they use a text. I, I had a theory about it and I totally forgot what it was. I think uh, that's just because I, that's what strings have become in Swift UI. But it's wrapping a string. It could just be a string. Oh, mm. oh no, I know what my theory is. My theory is that um, maybe that will grow to include attributed texts when they uh, add more attributes. Maybe. Um, which will be, a, it's a nice kind of forward looking thing if that's the reason. So yeah, double tap to select. Uh, and then we want to indicate something about whether it is selected. Um, and I think this is actually gonna go in the label yeah. value is different value would be for like if you have a slider as you're adjusting it you hear the value change huh. um or or um if you have a picker that's like title value title value so maybe uh you know the whole emoji picker would have a value which is the selected emoji maybe i'm not sure if that would be appropriate in this case but yeah in, in this case we want to interpolate in uh whether it's selected 
um, otherwise nothing. I would probably do like unselected is going to be the default. So I would, pr again, I guess it depends on what your use case is. Um, I think you'd only want to hear something, uh, put the quote back, get rid of, oh no, put the, yeah, I, had, oh, I, had, I gotcha. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. Let's see how that goes. Then, Translate. File. Okay. I have one more thought, but let's see how this Double works. Double tap to open. Pick your favorite emoji. Grinning face. Emoji. Code point. 1F600. Double tap to select. Grinning face. Emoji. Code point. 1F600 selected. Yep. The the way it, that I read selected was a little weird, but yeah. Like the word? Um, Normally... With accessibility, there's like a pause before it tells you the state. This one just like right into it. Oh yeah. So okay, maybe um maybe this the state is a different thing. Um, do you want to go back to that medium post that had all the different attributes? Traits. That's the word I couldn't remember. What was that? This is a link right back to it itself. Oh. Wait, which one are you on? You're on attributes. Did you click on traits? No, I was on attributes and I clicked on attributes. Okay. Do you want me to go to traits though? I think so. I actually don't know if it's attributes or traits. Uh, traits is traits is more like, does it update? Oh, is selected. Okay. Oh, okay. We don't have to invent the concept of selection. We can add a trait for whether it's selected. Remove traits. Whoa. Is button, is header, is selected, is link. What else we got? Is search field, is image, plays a sound, because that's important to make it not conflict with voiceover sound. Is a keyboard key, is static text, is summary element. Updates frequently, so that's like for slider or like, yeah, if you have some element, like a progress bar. So it won't be just reading, reading, reading. Or or something that can update off screen based on stuff you've done lower down in the screen. I've used that mm, to, yeah. to bring your attention back up. Oh, cool. Wow, there's a lot of these. Page turn <laughs> is modal. Yeah, cool. So it looks like we want to do the is selected one if it is selected. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, what was the um, what was the syntax for that? It was uh, trait, wasn't it? Add traits. Oh, interesting. It's add and remove, right? So this is actually really nice because it's a shortcoming in UI kit that you can just set and unset the traits. And if you want to add a trait to a system uh, element that already has some traits, you have to be careful not to get rid of the existing ones. But in this one, yeah, you can add the ones you want or remove the ones you want. Um, probably want to put it in a, uh, it's an, it's a, um, option set. So you can put it in, uh, just put empty brackets. So, uh, is selected question mark. If it is selected, then dot is selected. Otherwise empty array, which is a little weird. It might make more sense if you put it an array around is selected. Just to remember that like, this is an option set. So these are both array-ish things. Array adjacent. Why would you not take the dot? I know. OK. Uh, yeah, let's try it. Oh, and files. get rid of the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... Double tap to open. Use 3D touch to show and this home is cool screen because actions. It presumably has some smarts about when it needs to read that and when it doesn't. And it's like this the default pick system your, behavior. Pick your favorite emoji. Grinning face. Emoji, code point, 1F600. Double tap to select. Selected, grinning face, emoji, code point, 
one F six hundred. Yeah, so that's interesting. It actually puts selected first. Mm -hmm. Kind of makes sense because that's going to be the variable. So you like if you think about someone consuming this with sound only, you want to get the important uh, or interesting part first. It's also the reason I always leave my phone number first on voicemails. Not that it matters anymore, but like in the old days, huh. um, because you know the way someone consumes a voicemail, you've got to like, oh, I missed the phone number. I have to go listen through the whole thing to get to it at the end. So you want to make that easy. Same idea here. If you're consuming these things literally, you can't really, uh, not literally, linearly. If you're consuming these linearly, you can't really jump around as easily. So it helps to front load the important stuff. Sweet. So we've made Pick your favorite that zero whole percent. thing. I still can't move the slider. Uh, we've made the emoji picker a lot easier. Um, what other improvements would we like to make? Also throw questions in the chat if anybody has uh, accessibility questions. Pick your favorite emoji. It'd be interesting to see what what people are working on, what kind of problems grinning you've run into. With smiling if you have other stories like the, face with smiling you know, eyes adjusting and the string drop. to pronounce correctly. Voice it'd be interesting to hear, like, because a lot of this stuff is, um, you know, well well spelled out, but a lot of it is also just problem solving and figuring out like what is the most economical way to present the information to my user in a way that's not going to tire them out just like listening to a stream of stuff. So there's some really cool hacks and works around workarounds that you can come across. Zev, what's the way to turn off the screen when testing voiceover? Oh yeah, that's a great idea. Um, so there's a few, uh, actually quite a few shortcuts um, that you can do uh, when voiceover is enabled. And the one Matt is talking about is called screen curtain. Uh, I believe, I'm just gonna Google it. Uh, it's a three fingers something something. Uh, three fingers, oh, nope, wrong thing. Screen curtain on iPhone. Triple tap with three fingers. Okay. Or control option shift S on a keyboard. That's cool. Voice over on God 2021. Emoji picker. Heading. Screen curtain on. So now that the screen curtain's on, I can't see um, the app whatsoever, and neither can chat, and neither can Zev. Um, so this would liken as best we can to an unsighted person using the app and what i'm hoping for in, in this case is maybe there's some way that i'm swiping on the app that is making the slider not work and so i'm going to swipe through to see if we can get to the slider and we can make it work hey chat button i love this app switch button off zero percent adjustable swipe Zero. No. Zero percent adjustable. Yeah, still not happening. What if you uh, get rid of the emoji picker for a moment? Just comment it out. Maybe it's really messing something up. Sure. By virtue of its pickerness, I don't know. And then I want to say more things about screen curtain. Files. Uh, go for it now. Wow. This is building. Um, it's going to be fast. I'll wait. Okay. 0% adjustable. Still not working. 0% adjustable. Super weird. Swipe up or zero 10 internet points to anybody in the chat who can figure it out. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, so screen curtain, uh, it's definitely a good idea to test your app with the screen curtain enabled um, because it helps you not cheat. Like Center I've had this experience where I've, I've been adding voiceover support. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing all right. These things work. And then when I actually go to test it with screen curtain where I uh, can't see the screen, um, I realize like, oh, uh, the only reason I know how these two things are connected is because... Uh, I can see it. And so Screen Curtain really forces you to be honest with yourself about whether you're actually doing a good job of 
supporting accessibility. So uh, I recommend Speech it for off. testing. Uh, the other neat thing about Screen Curtain is that, uh, of course, when your screen is Speech off, on. Uh, you don't spend battery and the screen is like one, the top or, or second top uh, highest power consumer on a phone. So if you can use Screen Curtain, you can use your phone in your pocket. You don't even have to take it out. And, uh, you know, if you have headphones on and you save a bunch of batteries, so that's kind of neat. Um, it also like, I, I don't know if by default, if you went and like bought a random touchscreen from some electronic supplier, is it a, a normal thing to be able to have the, the pixel part be off, but the touch digitizer be on? Cause like, hmm. that's the kind of thing where you, you get your touch screens from the factory and then you're like, Hey, I want to add this feature where you can have the screen off to save battery, but still use the touch part. And then they were like, yeah, that's not a thing you can do. And it's the kind of thing that the software people have to like request and coordinate with the hardware people. So it's, that's one of those good, like Apple-y things. I, maybe Android phones support it. I don't know, but, but it definitely feels Apple-y. Yeah, I don't know. I've never, I've never tested accessibility outside of iPhones and iPads. There's a thing on Android called TalkBack. I want to say it's basically yeah. the same thing as Voiceover, but I don't know much about it. Uh, looks like you're using a shortcut to turn speech on and off. You want to talk about that? Uh, yeah. So, in the settings, let me turn it off. Voiceover off. Uh, in the settings for accessibility. <laughs> Uh, I've gone all the way down to the bottom to accessibility shortcut, and there I've selected voiceover. So if you read at the top, triple clicking the side button can toggle accessibility features on or off. Um, so I just I keep all of my devices set to voiceover because that's the one that my most often test. Because to the point um, earlier, if you cover voiceover, you generally cover other aspects of accessibility. I uh, I have a couple things turned on, and even if I were only going to use VoiceOver, I would turn another thing on because then it presents you a menu, and you get a chance to cancel it instead of accidentally turning on VoiceOver in like a movie theater. I've done that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you probably won't be able to see very well, but uh, when I triple oh, it's also going to blur it. When I triple click mine, I get this menu of like all the accessibility things that I use somewhat regularly to test or because I actually like use them. Um, but what I was actually uh, wanted to mention was, um, I think if you three finger double tap when voiceover is on, it turns speech on and off. Yes. And I think that's probably mostly for testing. Honestly, I can't think of much of a reason why you would want to use that as a regular user. I mean, maybe if you're like partially sighted and you, uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, but voiceover on, it, you're Got likely to do it accidentally on. and then have no sound and be very confused. So uh, take note: is, is it three finger double tap? Yep. Okay, so that's um, yeah, definitely good to know for if you accidentally do it, got to do it again to get speech back on. Ah! No, wait, no. <laughs> wait, what? Ha uh, did they? How, what? What? So there's, I'm double tapping and holding. Oh. And then it lets me scroll left and right instead of the up and down that voiceover says it should be. What if you turn speech back on? What does it do? Speech on. 26%, 26%, 42%, 57 percent Yeah, that's working. 63%, 64%. Oh, um, uh, yeah. So I'll for chat. For chat oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I am double tapping down here. 64 per 69 like percent yeah. 85 percent 79 per 57 percent 40 49 percent hmm. i don't know why the hint text says the other thing like did that did that change is uh, i don't know what's going on i don't know either uh you're saying um we are just catching up on some stuff from the chat uh, would progress view operate similar to a slider in that it responds with the value but not change the value um yeah so the thing with a progress view is that you need to drive it with something. Oh, you could put a progress view that is bound to the slider, except uh, if you're interacting with the slider, it, uh, you know, then the progress view won't be selected, so we won't hear a change. Um, well, you can just have it change every second. Uh, sure. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh... Now we get to learn how to do timers in SwiftUI. Uh, you can 
bind it to the same or actually not bind it's just the value it's just, percent adjustable. It's, just, uh, it's just size voice over off um no you have the value already the size from uh from the slider you can just but wouldn't that be changing i think let me let me let me stick with what um okay what i have in mind Oh, I don't think that's how you do a timer. Uh, yeah, it's not a state bar. It's just a let. Really? Yep. Um, so timer dot publish actually. We're just gonna do some uh, cool combiny kind of stuff. All right, talk me through this. So let timer equals capital T timer dot publish every oh wait uh which one do we want yeah every one second on the main run loop in dot common modes which we can get into if we want but it's kind of esoteric a uh, dot common yeah dot auto connect on the at the end after everything for reasons that i don't quite understand and then uh in your uh anywhere in your view so like just down at the bottom or something um like after the navigation view dot on receive uh put in the timer there perform uh and that will be uh you can do underscore in because you're not going to use it uh and then uh do um size equals uh double dot random or size equals dot random in i don't want to affect size though oh then get a get a diff make a different double i i think you should though because then the, then the slider and the progress will move together yeah i don't want that okay uh that'll need to be a state then It will speak the value if you select the progress view in voiceover. Yeah, it'll it'll basically be like a static thing, but then I think if we leave it selected, we'll see if it changes. Uh, oh yeah, just bump it up by one. That makes sense. Cool. Uh, it doesn't need to be a binding because the progress view won't be changing it. It's just a value. And when that value changes, the whole view gets re-rendered, uh, but you can't use an int. Oh, the progress view, uh, it doesn't know what the range is. I think you need to add a parameter to the initializer so that it knows, like, it's probably defaults to zero to one, but there's probably an in parameter. Uh, good luck. To oh, total. So it's just a max value. Where are you seeing that? Two down. There you go. But probably after progress. Yeah, just add a total parameter, put like 10. So that's like the max value. That makes sense. Um, Don't need a range because progress is always from zero to something. Yeah. All right. So yeah, we have a timer it's firing every second. Uh, yeah. Are you using a custom Safari icon? Voice over on. No. God 2021. Emoji picker heading. Huh. Uh, Big Sur is what that was. Yeah, yeah, it's a Big Sur one. Seven fifty nine at library. Maybe it's a retina Search thing. field. Me? Emoji picker heading. Yeah, so that this is exactly what I wanted to. Oh. Nice. Um, this is why I wanted this example as opposed to moving the slider because progress just went up without reading anything. And so I'm hoping that if we put um, the accessibility oh, I, trait I updates assume... frequently. I interesting. I assumed you were gonna be selecting it, but yeah, yeah. You wanna add 
So I thought update frequently was only for like, you might want to have it wrapped to zero in the else case, um, just so it'll keep running indefinitely. Uh, I wonder, I, I assumed update frequently was just like, hey, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna debounce it. I'm not gonna read it all the time. Um, but you think it might also like announce it even though it's not selected. I That's am, interesting. I'm hoping that in this case. Yeah. If it won't, there's some global accessibility and announce functions you can use. Library. Search field. Uh, but I don't know if that's the way to do something in Swift UI. Emoji picker. Heading. Yeah, still not reading it. Can you select it just to at least see, like, does it read it while it's selected? But then we can I figure love out this the app. Progress. 60%. I read it when I selected it. There it goes. 50%. Oh, yeah, it's UI accessibility. 90%. You post a notification. Yeah, so it's doing it. 20%. Interesting. It's deciding 60%. when it reads it. Mm hmm. 100%. That might be the updates frequently thing, actually, if you, yeah. if, you select, if you remove that. I don't know if that's a default on a progress view. If you remove it, it might read everyone. Suggestion at library. Search um, but field. then the um, there's an announce uh, notification thing we can try. I love this app. Progress fifty percent, ten percent. Yeah, it's still doing it. Fifty percent. It must get updates okay. frequently on its own. Ninety yep. percent. Um, so yeah, if you want to announce something arbitrarily, I, I guess there's not a way to do it automatically like you're talking about. Um, so it looks like you want to do, um, uh, it looks like you can do, I didn't think you could do a did set on a state bar. So I don't like that solution that I'm planning on stack overflow. I think you want to do like in your little update thing. Yeah. After that, you can do uh, UI accessibility dot, uh, post. And the notification is dot uh, announcement, and then a message. Uh, so just a string, anything you want to put in the string, like progress, whatever. But then I don't know if you have to be careful about not doing it while it's selected. Like this stuff gets fiddly. So there are I'm wondering I'm wondering if we want screen change as opposed to announcement. I've usually seen screen change use like if you're um presenting some kind of modal uh or or let's say uh I don't know to pick a random example you're in like an auction app and then you win the auction so the like the whole screen is going to change to like the one item and, and everything changes. You're going to want to say that. So it's like, okay, I'm at a new screen. I'm going to start at the top again. Yeah. Uh, or like if you're making a fake modal, that's not doing the normal modal accessibility stuff. Um, Cause there's a whole other section of this. That's like, if you're making a custom modal presentation, you need to tell the accessibility system that it is a, um, a modal, uh, like it, it takes over, the screen so that you can't read anything behind it. That's a really common voiceover bug um, where you, uh, yeah, that argument should be a string, I think. Oh, you're uh, trying it's... it without to see what happens. Yeah. yeah, it's any question mark, so see what happens. It might just be because of Objective-C. Speech off. Speech on. Emoji pick. Oh, God. Actually, because it's Progress. an any, not a string, um, I bet you could post an attributed string. 40%. 80%. Yeah, it's having the same behavior. 10%. Yeah. 50 speech off. Okay. Um, what would you suggest for a string here? Uh, so let's do, you mean for normal or did you want to try uh, attributed? 
Mm, either or. Oh, so um, let's do um, like pretend it's a download. Do download progress colon and then mm. interpolate in the progress. Also, like, just as a, a general pro uh, practice, uh, browse around Apple's apps with VoiceOver. Uh, they download generally have really good support, download so you can progress, find download out sort of progress, how, how download should download something speech work. Off. Sorry, uh, VoiceOver was going to say, say again what you were saying. Oh, just um, if you're working on VoiceOver stuff and you're, like, not sure how something should work from a usability standpoint, uh, go into the App Store, go into Mail, go into Safari, and try it out. See, so like, look at Apple's apps for examples. Yeah, so in the case of progress view, I'm going to say you don't need the updates frequently because it seems like that comes for free with it. And I would absolutely advise against doing what we have done here because it announces that every second the, the value is changing. And so, so every second we're changing the value and it therefore announces every second that the value has changed. Um, yeah, you might want to use it for like when the download finishes. Like you could put it in your in your loop back to zero. You could say download finished. Yeah, if this were a download thing. Yeah, you got you got to be cautious slash clever slash smart about when you fire these things. Speech on. So we'll see as the bar gets further. Hopefully it says it. Download finished. Yeah, there we go. It's not reading out the progress because we don't have the bar selected, but it does say that it finished when it gets there. Download finished. Cool. At also, like you can Search register field. for a notification voice over off uh for when the announcement is done so for example if you want your uh download finish to play a little ding but you don't want it to play over voiceover there's a way to register for uh an accessibility announcement did finish uh notification and then once the announcement finishes like you figure out which announcement it was and when it finishes then you play your ding in voiceover mode so you know again like it's that last 10% that makes a difference between a great app and a totally unusable, like my ding is playing over my speech and I can't tell what's going on. Yeah. Um, and the, the good news is if you have apps on the app store and you're like mind blown, never heard of this. And now you're breaking out into a cold sweat of, Oh my God, no one can use my app. Uh, a lot of this stuff just works out of the box. Um, those first few things that we swiped through at the start of this demo, I did nothing for. They're just regular Swift UI text, and it knew how to do all the voiceover and everything. Uh, it's when you start getting into those weirder things like our emoji picker um, that you need to start helping things. Or you, when you get into the case of read versus read or, or any of the other examples we gave that you need to go and adjust how the text is uh, pronounced. Um, so Apple has done a lot of great things to make this easy for us, not only providing us the tools to make the adjustments, but to actually do a lot of the work for us. Um, I think the next thing that's worth touching upon, Zev, is the accessibility inspector. Ooh, yes, for sure. Um... Do you want to switch to a simulator? I very much do. So voiceover doesn't work in the simulator, which is really annoying. And you might think, aha, I will turn on voiceover for my Mac, because like all this stuff works in the Mac too. Um, they have cool like trackpad gestures and keyboard shortcuts. But uh, even if you turn on voiceover on your Mac, I don't think it, like I think the, the simulator's content is just like opaque. What is wrong with Xcode? It's been drinking again. Common refrain around here. Command failed. Why did it fail? 
I haven't opened um, up the simulator in a while. So, uh, yeah, so, so voiceover doesn't work in the simulator, uh, which is unfortunate, and, and you do definitely want to do your final testing on the device. Um, but there's a tool called Accessibility Inspector, which can help you out with voiceover and a bunch of other stuff. It doesn't do full voiceover, but you can get sort of the gist by navigating through um, the app uh, accessibility labels. Um, so you can open it. Um, I think Matt used Spotlight to open it, but you can also, in Xcode, you can go to the Xcode menu and the open developer tool. And then there's a bunch of cool tools there. If you haven't looked at those tools, check them out. They're all kind of neat. Um, but yeah, we want accessible and inspector. And uh, it's important to do that if you have multiple versions of Xcode installed because it will open the right one for the Xcode you're using. So uh, here's accessibility inspector. And up at the top, it lets you choose which device you're inspecting, kind of like which device you build on an Xcode. And right now it's selecting the computer itself. But if you pick the simulator from there, it will be inspecting the simulator app, which is not what you want. Uh, that's like, how good a job did Apple's engineers make? Uh, how good a job did they do at making the simulator app itself, like its controls and stuff accessible? What you want to do instead is pick the device on the left and say, oh yeah, pick the simulator or your phone so it works there too. And then you're inspecting the simulator itself. That's what you want. Uh, so you can use the little um, blue crosshairs if you've used the similar thing in like the WebKit inspector, it's kind of similar. Um, so if you click that crosshair and then click in the simulator, wait, did it not work? It, Maybe the progress updating is messing things up. It might be. Um, let's kill the contents of the on receive for now, just because I think it might be doing stuff. Remember in Swift UI, it re-renders the whole view when everything changes or when anything changes. Uh, it should be doing some smart stuff to not re-render everything, but maybe it's not, or maybe simulator weirdness. So yeah, try now try hitting the... Um... It's unselecting the... Oh, the timer is still firing, which is still causing it to re-render even though we're not doing anything with it. So you probably want to kill the unreceive as well. Hopefully just the presence of a timer won't be enough to make it do stuff. Uh, I think you have to click the... Um, it's a, if I just mouse over it, it finds it. Is it reading them out loud? No. Okay, do, do the crosshairs off and on again, because I, I swear it's supposed to like highlight stuff visibly. All right, no idea. Uh, but you can click the little speech bubble in the navigation Emoji section picker. to turn speech on and off, I think, right? Is that what that does? I uh, hit the play button and it started speaking, and it was quite loud. But the button on the left of that... Emoji yeah, that picker thing, header. What, does it have a mouse over that tells you what it does? So whether or not speaking is on, yeah. And then you can use the left and right arrows to mimic swiping left and right. So it's not the same as voiceover, but they made some improvements recently that makes it pretty close. Oh, option space toggles inspection pointer. So maybe if you're in the simulator and you hit option space, maybe it will turn the thing on and off. Option space. Yeah, but with the simulator in the foreground. Yeah, yeah so I don't know why it's I not... click on anything, it, it kills it. Yeah. Hmm, okay. Uh, oh, so flip open those sections at the bottom, actions, element, and hierarchy. There's definitely a bunch of useful stuff there. Um, so hierarchy is neat. You can actually use this to inspect apps you don't own. Like if you're wondering how some view is built in some other app, it can give you a sense of the hierarchy, uh, which is kind of cool because you can like inspect menus in Xcode or whatever. Um, it's the accessibility hierarchy, not the real hierarchy, but those are often the same thing. Um, and there's also up above, there were some actions you can perform. So if you arrow over to the button or actually to the slider, maybe we can figure out why our slider is not working. Um, so yeah, you can see the label and now it's, oh, it's zero adjustable. Yeah. So, uh, activate increment and decrement. You can click the increment or decrement buttons and they will do nothing. We don't know why, but if you select the toggle switch, maybe that'll work. I think it's working it's just moving it very small oh oh you're right cool all right um, so because we it works in here not i don't know if we can do that with a slider can we set step value 
on its 50Y value uh, uh, slider? No. Yeah. Not as far as I know. So that might be why that's acting weird from that perspective. Um, but we can click on the switch. Yeah, I feel it's, I feel like the accessibility uh, inspector doesn't like SwiftUI as much as it hmm. does uh, UIKit. I mean, fair enough. SwiftUI is pretty new, and it's pretty fundamentally different in terms of like, uh, you know, because the whole view is re-rendering, the whole accessibility tree is probably recalculating. Yeah. And there's probably some stuff that needs to be done to like bookmark your place in it when it re-renders. But hopefully, we'll get there. Um, it sounds like again, the accessibility team is like going wild doing stuff. So that's pretty cool. Uh, there's two tabs, two more tabs in the accessibility inspector that I didn't know about for years, and it blew my mind when I found out about them. So audit's pretty cool. It will look at look for, for common, mostly uh, hit area and contrast issues on the current screen in your app. So like pull up your app or pull up some other app. Like, okay, contrast is not high. And if you click on it, I think what will it, oh yeah. So it shows you a screenshot of the part of the screen that is bad. So it's saying the text contrast ratio is four. Uh, it doesn't say what they're shooting for, but I believe the standard is uh, 4.5 or higher for contrast so like cool apple's default button is <laughs> too low contrast that's neat uh hit area is too small on what hey chat again uh, on the same on hey chat okay so like apple recommends hit area of 44 by 44 or bigger and since that's only 20 tall it's not uh not gonna get the full hit area uh what's that one so the whole switch is not tall enough and then potentially inaccessible text. That's interesting. What's going on there? Uh, what does it say in the, if you flip it down, if it, what does it explain? This element appears to display text that should be represented using the accessibility API. Oh, was it skipping when you? Yeah, it read the bar. It didn't read oh, that. But did the bar say progress? Yes. Okay, so that's maybe another thing where the accessibility inspector hasn't caught up with SwiftUI, where like those values are represented in the accessibility hierarchy but not in a way that the inspector knows about. So, you know, maybe to celebrate global accessibility awareness day, we should all be filing some bugs. <laughs> uh, well, wait till WWDC and then file bugs if there's still bugs. Uh, and then go to the last tab, unless you wanted to say anything else about this tab. Nope. Okay. So this one's real cool. Uh, you can like you can change the font size uh, in the simulator by going into settings and doing all the stuff, but why would you? Because you can do this, which is pretty great. Uh, super nice for checking um, dynamic type. We haven't even talked about dynamic type. I think like I do. Want that's to talk the about other. That. Yeah. That's the other like fairly simple thing you can do that has huge accessibility benefits, because like phones are small and the te the type is necessarily small uh, for the for the common case. But like a ton of people use um, uh, different font sizes. Font sizes. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a really easy thing to change and like uh it it's yeah, since you know, since the advent of um auto layout uh and the Swift UI layout system, like it's fairly easy to do a decent job, uh, especially if you use the system standard fonts. And if you're customizing fonts, just make sure that they're also gonna scale um when this user changes their system font size. So to that end, um Let's talk about dynamic type because, let's and let's put this back to the way that I had it originally. Cause I did look at dynamic type in this app and um, you actually don't need to leave Xcode. You don't need to go to the accessibility inspector to work on mm -hmm. dynamic type um, Good point. with, I think this version, this most recent major version of Xcode. Uh, this uh, environment overrides was added. Not only is it a great place to test, you know, dark mode, which is how I primarily used it. Um, you can test your dynamic type, which is how I secondarily primarily use it. <laughs> um, so you can toggle that switch on and you can move the slider up and down. And you can see how your view reacts. And you can see when we get 
pretty big, the tech starts getting cut off on our slider, our, our little picker here. Good point. That's because of that frame height 100. If we took that off, did that fix it? Because we only did that to test the slider. No, it actually did that before. I'm pretty sure. Oh. Yeah, so we'd have to figure out how to measure and set the height of the scrolling thing. Scroll measuring with scrolling stuff is always the worst. Yeah. Hmm. Come I on now. Catch up. I wonder, yeah, it's always kind of slow initially. I wonder if it's like hooking a debugger and being slow about that. There's also a bunch more options at the bottom than... Um, the accessibility inspector provides like button shapes on off labels. It just totally dead. Neat. Yeah. Let me try. If you put the switch it. and stuff uh, back, then um, those uh, we should see some more things show up when you do that. Button shapes is a cool one. So on off labels, you can see it added that little dot to the switch and the line when it's turned on, which I don't personally find all that much better, but I guess that helps some people. Yeah, I think it might actually be like that by default in uh, Europe, hmm. I want to say, because like those uh, one and zero symbols are more prevalent over there. Like even back in iOS before seven, I think the switch would even say on and off in the little blue switch or maybe i'm misremembering maybe that was accessibility as well but uh in europe it would have the one and zero instead yeah i don't know what's up with the things like kind of not working it's weird smart invert works hmm. i don't know what differentiate without color does do you um i don't know if there are any system things in particular that uh respond to it um, maybe on the mac i would think the like window close buttons do but it's more a hook um for your app like you, there are ways to query these things globally in like the environment or something and then you would do things like um you know if you have a color matching game uh what what differentiate without color basically means is uh make it colorblind compatible hmm. so when you when the user has that setting turned on maybe you uh add shapes in addition to colors or add symbols in addition to colors or switch your colors to a colorblind friendly palette um yeah i'm gonna check on my mac uh differentiate without color. while you're while you're checking that i think mm -hmm. um the call out that i want to make here is dynamic type um things like this increase contrast they work best when you use out of the box system colors for things like entry increase contrast and out of the box text styles um, if you use um, font where you're specifying the font family or the size uh, dynamic types sometimes gets broken with that if not always hold on I've never ridden a motorcycle, so I don't know, but I feel like people just rev it to rev it. Um, I heard a quiet motorcycle the other day, and I was like, wait a minute. They don't have to sound like that? Small small tangent. Uh, I've been watching Ewan McGregor's series, uh, Long Way Around, A Long Way Down, and then more recently, A Long Way Up, that's an Apple TV Plus exclusive, and they did... Uh, all electric motorcycles and trucks on their trip from the most southern tip of South America to LA and the electric bikes were inaudible they're just like small hums uh, super cool anyway um, so you want to use <laughs> the the native colors and textiles where you can because that's how you get these things for free um, if you want to use custom colors or you want to use custom fonts, you can. You just have to do some extra legwork to add in the support for it. Um, I generally, when I'm on a project, I, I advise against uh, things like custom fonts because the, the amount of work to support that and, and make sure that it always stays supported as more of these accessibility features come out is really difficult. 
um, and error prone. So stick native when you can. Uh, anything else accessibility we would like to cover tonight, Zev? Uh, I'm gonna um, run through the accessibility uh, screen. I mean, I, I just will say like, if you're new to this, uh, I think last year or the year before they made accessibility a top level item in settings on the iPhone, just kind of as an acknowledgement that like accessibility isn't just for those people over there, right? It's it's for all of us. It's everybody probably has some something they can benefit from in the accessibility settings. Uh, so if you haven't played with it, I encourage you to go check it out. Like maybe you want to bump your font size up or maybe your vision is super good and you want to bump your font size down so you can see more stuff on screen at once. Like that's an option. Um, you know, play with voiceover, um, play with uh, some of the other more kind of niche things. Um, but like, uh, let me just see uh, what are what are some of the accessibility things that I use every day uh, that you might not think of as accessibility. So uh, under AirPods, uh, I turn on noise cancellation with one AirPod because I often only have one in, but I still want to like, if I'm running the sync and I can't hear very well, uh, I will, you know, press and hold and turn on noise cancellation. And then I can hear, uh, just through that ear. And I don't find that bothersome. I'm guessing they have it turned off because most people do. Um, that's under AirPods, but, uh, not accessibility. That's under air. It's under accessibility than AirPods. If you have AirPods. Oh yeah. I don't have to connect to yeah, this device. I'm not showing up. Yeah. Um, what other stuff I use? Um, I use Zoom a fair amount more on the Mac. Um, there's a setting to hold the Control key and scroll up, like you like a normal two finger scroll or scroll wheel scroll, and it just makes the thing under your mouse a little bit bigger. Um, there's voice control. I mean, voice control is wildly cool. You, if you, oh yeah, you can ask Siri to turn it on or do it in uh, settings. That was added last year, and it's full, uh, full voice control of the phone. So like. You, you talk to it, you say, hey, push this button and it will push it and then you can see what's going on. Um, it uses the same labels. So accessibility label, you can say, um, it's confusing because I keep asking it to show labels, but the real word you say is names, like show names, I think. Um, but then it will turn on a little overlay over your screen where you can see what everything is called. Um, you can also say show numbers and it will just number all the interactable elements and you can say like tap whatever, or um, you can say show grid and then just name grid squares and it will zoom in uh, on on the grid square you want. So like that stuff is super cool. And there are a bunch of uses for that um, that aren't necessarily, you can't use your hands. Like there, there are reasons you might want to do that. Yeah, my old designer um, used that to even test uh, voiceover because much like me, he wasn't very good at swiping through the things to get sliders mm -hmm. working apparently. Um, but yeah, it's it, it was actually really fun to watch him talk at his phone and navigate through the app we were working on. Oh, another uh, actually really popular one that uh, I kind of forgot about in the era of um, notch phones is assistive touch. Um, assistive touch shows this little, um, where is it? It's under touch. Um, it, it brings up this little dingus on your screen that kind of moves around. I can see if the, yeah, go turn it on. So you get this little floating white thing and you can move it around and you can tap on it and it brings up mostly hardware related things, but you can like super duper customize it, put a bunch of stuff in the menu. Uh, what I see a lot of people using it for is like if they break their home button back when phones had home buttons, you can put a virtual home button in here and tap it. Um, and apparently in some country that I don't want to name because I'll probably forget which one it was, uh, there was apparently this sort of like meme going around that I, I think like there was one generation of iPhone that had a production problem and some of the, the home buttons wore out quickly. And then that, you know, got changed over time into all iPhone home buttons wear out all the time and it will kill your resale value. Uh -huh. So like in Apple stores, not official policy, but like everybody knew to do it. They, when you bought a new phone, they would say, here, let me, let me do this thing for you. And they would turn on assistant touch. So people weren't using their home buttons. Uh, like that's just a thing that a whole bunch of people in the world do. So it's worth knowing about, um, but yeah, you can like put, um, you, you can put some cool shortcuts and stuff in there and use them. And I don't know if it comes uh, on right by there. default with notch phones, but I, I, I like this reachability one where if you swipe down on the yeah. home bar, it pulls the screen down so you can tap the, the buttons that are out of thumb reach. For sure. I do that all the time on non notch phones, phones with a home button. 
you um, double tap the home button, like you don't click it, you just rest and raise your finger twice. And it, yeah, same thing. I think you do have to turn it on. Yeah. Um, but that's a really good one. Um, you can do a bunch of stuff with haptics, um, like if you, you know, if haptics are distracting or something. Um, oh, shake to undo. Like that's one if you find yourself triggering it accidentally all the time, you can turn that off. Uh, a bunch of stuff about call routing. Uh, there's amazing support for hearing aids. Oh, here's another cool one. Um, there's a thing called Live Listen. If you have, uh, mostly I think it's just Apple and Beats headphones, um, but you can turn it on. It becomes a little um, a little thing in your control center. Uh, it's like an ear icon. You turn it on and your headphones, not hearing aids, just regular Apple headphones become like a hearing aid. So the mic on your phone will pick it up. Um, like if, if you have some hearing loss, often what's hardest is like you can uh, you can hear fine if you're like really able to concentrate on someone, but if there's background noise, it becomes really hard. So let's say you're at a restaurant uh, with a lot of background noise, you turn on live listen, you give them your phone, like put it in front of the person you're talking with, and then you can hear them because it's picking up their voice closer and putting it through your headphones. Like that's super cool. And you don't have any, have any extra hardware if you already have Apple headphones. So yeah, super cool stuff. And guided access is the other, like everybody probably has some use for this sometime in their life. Uh, if you're going to um, hand your phone to somebody and you want to lock it into an app or uh, give it to a kid and don't want them messing with the screen. Or, I mean, it's also used like for a kiosk, like an iPad with a login system for an office building. You're going to put it in guided access uh, so that you can only use that one app. Oh, cool. Uh, under accessibility, uh -huh. under spoken content, uh, up at the top, uh, -huh. uh, under pronunciations, you can, how did I do this? I think you, I think you speak. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, my, uh, wife's last name is Peterson, but it's spelled like Pedersen. So it, the thing was always reading it wrong and you can add a system wide uh, replacement pronunciation. Yeah, exactly. How do you speak into it? Oh, dictate or spell out. Is there not a button? So for me, there's a dictation button. Oh, yeah, there's I'm the guessing microphone. Because you're in screen share. There's a microphone at the bottom. Oh. At the bottom. No, that's just for regular wow. dictation on the keyboard. Enable dictation. Ah, you don't have it. Uh... Yeah, so maybe you have to do that. And then I'm guessing that button. I'm guess Dias. That's, but that's just speaking into the keyboard. What you need to do is delete that and click the special microphone on that text field. Huh. And it'll put in... Dias. Oh, jeez. Yeah. <laughs> yep. See if it'll play them for you. Dias. Yo-ho. Dias. 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 That's amazing. How Dias. cool is that? Hey, chat, that's how you say like, my name. <laughs> like n never mind like all the amazing accessibility stuff i'm now going to use this if i want to learn what the ipa is for something the international phonetic alphabet yeah. like, i don't have anything else uh, uh at my disposal where i can speak into it and it will give me ipa that's super cool that's incredible yeah things you learn oh cool if you uncheck apply to all apps i'm guessing you can set which apps you want that to be effective in amazing I, I learn something new every time I go in the screen. There's so much stuff. Like Apple's accessibility team is like the most amazing team at that company or any company. Like the, just so much stuff they do, so many edge cases. You you kind of think about Apple as like, you know, they're the company you go to when you want something opinionated where, you know, they've they've done the research and they've decided this is the shape that phones should be. And if you don't want or if you want a different shape, like too bad, this is, you know, you, you get the Apple experience, except in accessibility, because um, one of the big lessons to learn about accessibility is that there's not like a prototypical accessibility user. Like every single person is going to have their own combination of these settings and preferences and needs. And uh, I think the accessibility team at Apple really understands that because they, they have so much more of a degree of customizability than you know, you go into like the contacts app settings and there's like a couple things about first, last or last first, but then you go into the accessibility settings and you can like wildly fine tune. If you look at switch control, there's like a whole bunch of uh, options about like dwell time and behavior about looping around, like really super fiddly stuff 
they can totally make a difference for somebody in terms of like, can they even use this thing day to day? Um, so it's really cool that they go that extra bunch of miles. Yeah, I think I think that's a good place to end it. Um, sure. So chat, thanks for uh, watching as we talk through accessibility in Swift UI and general accessibility features in iOS and on iPhones. Um, I hope you all learned something. Um, at the start of today's session, I mentioned our Discord link, exclamation point Discord in chat. We do have an accessibility channel. You can come join us there. And if you have any questions from the session or as you're going through your apps and auditing it for accessibility, if you run into some issues, go ahead, hop into that chat, and we'll do our best to help you. Um, and yeah, hope to see you in the next one. Have a good one.